I guess it's a cardinal. They say pretty, 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 pretty. All right. Well, good morning, Rotary District 7770, and welcome to Conversations with Rotary Action People for Monday, April 5th, or what is also known as Easter Monday. Hope you guys had a wonderful weekend and a wonderful Easter. My name is Donald Hovis, and I'm your CRAP host. I'm from the Chicora Rotary Club in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Spring is here, hopefully finally. And uh, today we're going to hear all about making it grow during the spring season. Joining us is Amanda McNulty. Amanda, we look forward to your presentation in a few moments after we do some announcements to kick off today. Those of you on the call, thank you for being here. In the chat box, put your name, your Rotary Club, and what'd you get in your Easter basket yesterday? Or what's your favorite part about Easter? Do you have a tradition that you do in your family? Is it an egg hunt? Is it a special meal? We want to know what you did Easter in your house and in your family. I would like to thank uh, our public image chair from the Five Points Rotary Club in Columbia, Mary Gask, for setting up today's presentation. We do look forward to it. I was just going to turn it over to her, and oh, here she comes back. All right. Amanda, how about uh, introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, I, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for letting me be with you this morning. What a nice way to start. The week. This is a week I'm taking off um, mostly um, to do yard work. I'll tell you a little about myself. I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, um, my father, um, father's family was in the insurance and real estate business. My grandfather and Mr. Haltawanga built the Palmetto Building, which is kind of fun. That's a beautiful old building in downtown Columbia. And um, so when the Christmas parades came, we would go downtown. It faced Main Street some of the offices did and we would go in and raise up these huge big windows on the second and third floor and get to lean out and watch the Christmas parades. Um, I um, got married young. I went to Carolina. My mother wanted me to be social and she made me go to Randolph Macon Women's College, which was not um, much of a fit for me. And then I came back to Carolina and had a lot of fun and flunked out and got married when I was um, 20 and um, married an artist and we moved to Atlanta. And my husband still paints pictures. The house is here is covered with pictures because um, it's a funny way to try to make a living in South Carolina. We moved to St. Matthews. My husband was from St. Matthews. His name is Edward Wimberly. Um, I, um, our house was built by, some of you in Columbia would have known Dr. Philip Ferry, a very famous um, physician there. Whose, father, whose grandfather built the house we lived in about 1880. Um, we are trying to get it painted, which is a good thing that we've never bought a new car because everything that you would spend on a new car, it's gonna take to paint a house this old. I have three children. They all live in Los Angeles and I really have missed them dreadfully. We haven't seen them at all. Um, so um, I used to do private gardening. Um, I studied, went back to Clemson and studied horticulture and um, then I went to South Carolina State University and got a degree in teaching. Teaching middle school was not um, something I was going to be successful at. Um, I did private gardening with a woman named Ruthie Lacey, and we did really fancy, fancy, fancy weddings and parties. And um, Mr. Hovis seems to be on the telephone. I don't know if that means that's a problem or not, or if he's just talking on the phone. Um, anyway, I guess he's like a teenager. Teenagers talk on the phone all the time. Um, anyway, so... Um, Making it, I was a Clemson extension agent and Roland Austin was in charge of making it grow. And since I was right there in Sumter, although I live in St. Matthews, he often asked me to come on the show and I ended up being the host. The, um, the show has been rather dramatically different to do. It used to just be an hour of sitting around live. It was so easy, um, but it was also um, not as good as it could have been because people um, called in with questions and we felt like the person on might not have been the person best qualified to answer the question. So now what we do is we have individual Skype, which is a higher resolution than Zoom, talks with people and our wonderful producer, Sean Flynn, who just won the Roland Alston Media Award from Clemson this year, very well deserved, um, spends hundreds of hours editing. Um, but now what we do is we, um, 
ask if someone someone's coming on who's a specialist, we ask them what they would like to talk about. Um, turf grass, for instance. And so they make up the questions and we act like we got the questions from somebody. And that way the person can talk about their specialty and really give the very best possible information. So um, although it's very difficult, we feel like it's a much better program and we will never go back to the old way of doing things again which I'm really excited. Um, and it also means nobody has to drive to Sumter and then drive home late at night, which was no fun for anybody and really limited the number of people we could talk to. Um, Tony Melton, if you've ever watched the show. Um, oh, and first of all, <clears throat> um, if you're not a member of the SCE TV endowment, you should be. Um, the state of South Carolina gives um, pay salaries of some people at ETV, but there's no money for programming or anything at all. And all of that comes through the ETV endowment um, in Spartanburg. I would encourage you um, to do, to become a member. Um, and if you do, I think you, sh I would encourage you to say you're doing it for making it grow. I am um, without shame anymore. If you're in business, you know that you have to have money to get things done. And so do not think that public television is funded. All the shows that we bring from other places that you like to watch, everything is paid for through the endowment. Only a, only a small number of salaries at ETV come through state government. Um, the, the Five Points Rotary Club actually even very wonderfully is in charge of parking um, for football games at the ETV um, headquarters because they're right across the street from um, from the football stadium. Anyway, Tony Melton, who's on the show frequently says the three most, what are the three most important things that you should do add to your soil um, to improve your gardening success? And the answer is organic matter, organic matter, organic matter. Um, South Carolina soils are old and very low in organic matter. Um, if you've got, there's a wonderful story that they tell about one of the famous vegetable farmers um, families over in Lexington County where they have sandy soils, um, exquisitely drained soils, they say. And the story is that um, one of the, the, the founder of one of the farms who was no longer able to drive, his grandchildren would pick him up every morning and would take him around um, because he wanted to be driven around in a truck to, to see the fields and he said, why is the um, mule barn field, because farmers name their fields after things that had some association with them, um, so much greener than the Smith property field, a property they had bought from an adjacent family. And they said, Daddy, you remember those clips and people, clips and people um, planted a cover crop in the mule barn film field last year and the organic matter content went up by 1%. And that was enough difference in the fertility and the quality and the water retention of the soil to make a visible difference to a man who could no longer drive. Um, in South Carolina, if you've got three or 4% organic matter, you're pretty fortunate. Organic matter is the smallest component of the soil fraction. Um, if you had a block of soil, half of it is solids, and that is composed of sand, silt, and clay. Sand being the largest particle, silt being the middle size one, and clay being the tiniest. Clay just stays in suspension, as you've probably seen sometimes if you've um, seen a muddy hole um, or seen a, you know what clay does when, it, um, when you ride through a mud bike and it gets on your car. Um, <clears throat> And those are the major ones and those define the soil structure. So you can have a sandy loam or you can have a clay loam or a silt loam. And when you send a soil test to Clemson, they tell you what your soil texture is. And one thing that you should understand is you can order as many top loads of sand as you want to. And there's no way in the world that you can change your soil um, texture. You cannot do it. It is impossible. It would take massive, massive, massive amounts and you would be unable to distribute it in the soil. You can, however, change your soil structure and structure is the way the aggregates in your soil are put together. Um, and a lot of that has to do with um, partially the um, 
components of your soil. Sand has the worst structure for holding nutrients or water. If you've ever dealt with the sandy soil, um, you know that it, you, you water it and then it's dry again the next day. There's nothing there to hold on to water. Um, if we were in a, in a room together, I would pick three people and ask them to go to stand in the front of the room. And I would say, please make a water molecule, molecule for me. Mary, what is the formula for water? Mary Gasquey. Is it H2O? Is that what you H yeah, H2O. Okay, so I would say I would say two of you people are hydrogen atoms, and one of you is an oxygen atom. Um, Y'all make a uh, make a water molecule for me, and probably and I would say, Mary, you're the oxygen, and so probably your two friends would stand on either side of you in a line, and that would be H and then O and then H, and we would think that was a water molecule, but that's not the way a mo water molecule is actually um, exist in exist because oxygen, um, and Mary, this is not um, in any way leveled at you, oxygen is really, really, really negative. It has several empty <laughs> spaces in its outer valence that it wants electrons for, and it doesn't have them. And it's just terribly, terribly in need of um, satisfying it. No one likes to be um, unbalanced. And um, and hydrogen has one little electron. And so the oxygen grabs hold of that one electron and pulls it in and leaves the positive part of the hydrogen kind of out there on its own waving on both sides. So you end up with me being the big oxygen molecule that's got these new electrical negative charges. And then out here are the little hydrogen. So you've really kind of got a triangle and the oxygen area has a very strong negative charge and the little hydrogens have a positive charge. Well, guess what? Um, soil and nutrients all have charges too. And so if you've got, um, um, if you've got a lot of organic matter in your soil, um, it has electrical, it has positive and negative poles and the water, um, which has the water molecule, the, the, the negative oxygen part will tend to hold on to the positive part of the organic molecule, which means that the um, water holding capacity of your soil increases as you have more organic matter or more clay, but particularly organic matter. If you can increase the organic matter of your soil by 1%, after a rain event or an irrigation event, your acre of soil can hold 20,000 more gallons of water for um, four or five days. That's dramatic. That is hugely different because water is the new oil. Water is what it's all going to be about in, and in the world it already is. And in farming it is also too. So as we increase organic matter, we increase the water holding capacity of our soil. We also increase the structure of our soil. One of the wonderful things about earthworms is they have, um, and if you've ever, um, if it's rained and you're taking a walk, you'll see an earthworm that's walked up onto the sidewalk. Um, and if he's still alive, pick him up and put him back in the grass. Earthworms, this is just the most remarkable thing in the world. You're just gonna love this. Earthworms use oxygen just like we do although they don't have, really have a blood system, circulatory system like we do, but they do have a, a vascular system that moves oxygen throughout their body and it's carried on the hemoglobin molecule, an earthworm and a human being and mammals. Is that not just one of the most fascinating things you'll ever learn in your life? And so when there's a big rain in the soil, oops, and I've got to go back. Okay, so we had our block of soil um, here's my Brent and Becky's catalog. We'll use that. My block of soil, half of it is solids. And the solids are clay, silt, and sand in those different capacities. The teeniest, tiniest percent is organic matter. Okay. Um, then, but the whole block of soil has pores in it, pore spaces. Some of the pore spaces are filled with air, just the ambient air, and some are filled with water. Okay, when you have a great big rain event, 
um, this is when my sister who, uh, my sister named Cappy Hubbard, and she's extremely um, polite and has um, done everything right her entire life. Um, people say, which one of you was adopted? Um, but anyway, um, I say that a rain event um, does for the air and the soil, like when you fart in the bathtub, um, because you know what happens when you fart in the bathtub, there are bubbles that come to the top. So when there's a rain event, all the air spaces in the soil are filled with water and the air is pushed out and comes to the top. So the soil is saturated with water, um, which is um, not a good, that's fine to start with, but you don't want it to end up that way. If corn sits in saturated soil for over something like 14 hours, it dies. So when you talk about plants dying from water saturation, um, that, that truly happens. And it's because although plants get oxygen, get, the car get um, carbon dioxide from little windows called stomata that are in the holes underneath their leaves that they can open and close at will. And that also enclosed in controls transpiration, which is how plants can cool themselves by losing water vapors, kind of like sweat for us. Um, um, when plants get, so you think, well, they've already got their, these little windows that are opening up to the ambient air, but they don't get oxygen that way. Guess where they get oxygen? Anybody know? Somebody knows, come on. They get oxygen from their roots, their root hairs, from tiny, from pore spaces in the soil where the ambient air just moves um, just moves down into the soil. When the soil is not saturated, some of those pore spaces are filled with the ambient air, and that's where plants get their oxygen. Because although plants use carbon dioxide, they store carbon dioxide. They feed the world by taking carbon dioxide and with that wonderful process of photosynthesis in the presence of sunlight, turn it into sugars, turn it into carbohydrates. It is the basis of life on earth. But it doesn't do any good to store carbohydrates. I stored a lot of them yesterday, more than I should have, and I bet some of you did too, if you can't burn them up. And what do we use to burn up our carbohydrates? You tell me. <sighs> our respiration cycle. So plants have a photosynthetic cycle and they have a respiration cycle. And the respiration cycle depends on oxygen and they get oxygen from poor spaces in the soil, and they take that oxygen up through those very fine root hairs. So a water logged soil is one that is not helpful to plants. And I'm sorry, I can't make all these turn off that work. They know how to do it. Um, so that's why an earthworm comes up to the top of the soil after the, a heavy rain. Earthworms use oxygen, they breathe oxygen. Well, if they're down in the soil and there's no oxygen because all the pore spaces in the soil have been filled with water, they have to come up to the surface and then they are out there wandering around trying to figure out what to do. They end up on the sidewalk and unless you are very kind and we lean over and pick one up and put him back on the grass or the soil so he can go back down in there and make his living again. They have a if when, but when you're picking one up, if he's alive, you can squeeze him very gently. Don't squeeze him hard. If you squeeze the wrong end of him, a little pellet will come out of excrement. Um, and that's so that's the wrong end. If you squeeze the other end, they stick their tongue out and they have a wonderful rough tongue called a radula. And they go through at, throughout the soil and come up to the top and get tiny little bits of plant material and swallow them. And then they um, and that and they digest them. Well, if you had dirt and leaves inside your intestinal tract, you'd like to coat it with something so that you didn't get what's the thing you get when you get strawberries in your intestines and it causes a diverticulitis. So an earthworm does it want diverticulitis. So they make all this wonderful mucus and they coat those that food that they're digesting. And when they excrement, when they excrete it, it comes out in these wonderful little pellets that add structure to your soil. So a lot of people go around and buy earthworm pellets because it adds structure to your soil. And structure again means that your soil is going to make little clumps, not dirt clogs, but tiny discrete clumps that let air and moisture go through your soil. 
Um, and that means that plant roots can go through your soil more easily too. So a well um, textured soil, um, you can't change the texture by adding, you can't change the texture by bringing in truckloads of sand. Just don't even bother with it, don't even think about it. You can change the texture by bringing in compost. Because remember that farmer in Lexington County, the percent of organic matter went up 1% and he could see a visible difference. Um, the new thing that's happening in farming is that our farmers um, out West in the, in the Midwest, several things happen that make those incredibly fertile soils. First of all, those, those lands were covered by the prairie grasses and believe it or not, gr prairie grasses are about grass, prairie grasses, not turf grass, not turf grass, listen to me, not turf grass. Um, the prairie grasses, grass sloughs off its roots tremendously. So lots of cells, lots of debris goes from the roots into the soil. And those prairie grasses that had roots three, four, five feet deep um, gave off masses amounts of organic matter that made those the richest soils that we have in our country. And guess what happens in the winter? This, I don't want to go to Chicago in the winter. Um, I don't want to go to Minnesota in the winter because tell me what happens. The soil freezes solider than solid. And I can't even remember the last time I saw the soil heave in South Carolina. So in the soil, we have all these, besides the earthworms, which are the macro, de, de, um, the macro um, degraders, we have micro degraders. And those are microorganisms that sit there and eat organic matter. And it's wonderful because they break it down into components that can be used by plants and by other organisms into the nitrogen, the potassium, the phosphorus, the calcium, the magnesium, all those um, minerals and elements that plants need for plant growth. When, um, you know, when, when a deer gets hit in the road, the first thing that happens is the vultures come and then the, you know, somebody else comes and finally, you know, the, it's a slot, it's, you know, just covering the soil and the earthworms are coming and then the micro the micro invertebrates are coming. And so organic matter gets psych recycled and recycled and recycled. And that's the only way that, um, that, that plants can get those nutrients. And so the macro um, so we've tried, we're trying to build up organic matter, but those micro de decomposers mostly use oxygen just like we do. <sighs> and the way that farmers traditionally every single year have farmed is because at home their wife is saying the washing machine needs fixing, um, the, you know, the, the tires need changing, the, there's something that, you know, we all have a to-do list and farmers love to get in tractors. It used to be that nobody could talk to them in tractors and they got to drive up and down the field all day long and nobody could bother them and they were turning up the earth. And that meant that the micro organisms in the soil were getting huge amounts of oxygen. They were being exposed to massive amounts of ambient air. It was as if you had a bellows and you were forcing air down into the soil. So instead of just having that top layer where the microorganisms were getting a lot of oxygen and acting faster than usual and breaking down organic matter, these decomposers now, whenever you, whenever you till, um, um, every one of them is just working 100%, 90 miles an hour, all day long and night. Um, and so we, so we never build up organic matters in our soils. One of the reasons, if you go to the mountains, have you ever noticed how they'll grow tomatoes and things in the bottomlands? That's because in the bottomlands, there's more water. The water saturation stays higher in the bottomlands. Most of the micro um, degraders or aerobic need oxygen. There are only a few that are anaerobic. Um, Pluff mud at the beach has that funky smell because the 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 um, micro um, degraders there are anaerobic and it's a much slower process. Um, so the new so and then out when the soils freeze, all those micro um, degraders, those little wonderful microorganisms, stop because they're dependent on um, the the ambient air for they're just like they're cold blooded. So in South Carolina, we have a lot of strikes against us in trying to build organic matter. 
And when I first moved to St. Matthew's, one of our favorite things to do at night was when they were going to burn the fields, they would burn the crop residue. And you would go out there and, be, and you know, not only was it the worst thing in the world for, for the climate change to do all this burning, um, but also they burned organic matter. It was very dramatic and fun to see, but it meant that the fields were sterile. You could go out into a field and dig for a half an hour and never find an earthworm. There was nothing in those soils to support life. Everything had to be spoon fed. All the water had to be spoon fed. There was no organic matter to hold on to the water. Remember I said, if you could increase the organic matter of your field by 1%, you could hold 20,000 gallons after a rain event per acre for three or four days. That's huge. There was none of that there. There was no organic matter that would hold on to nutrients. Remember, um, you know, we've got these negative and positive poles to hold on to nutrients. So every single thing had to be spoon fed, an extremely um, expensive. And um, now we found out environmentally damaging process because nitrogen is highly soluble. And so if you put out a lot of nitrogen, um, organic nit um, synthetic nitrogen on your field. Um, now I say that synthetic nitrogen is like beer in a fraternity boy. You put it on and you piss it out. There's it's it's nothing holds on to it except a little bit except organic matter. So if you don't have any organic matter, if you put nitrogen out and you get one inch of rain and you don't have organic matter in your soil, your nitrogen is leached below the root zone of your plants. And so what do they do? they go out and they put on more. And what happens to that excess nitrogen? It often is taken to nearby streams and lakes where it can cause algal blooms, which can be very de damaging and um, devastating um, and even toxic. So um, that's the way we did things. And that's what Clemson Extension told people to do. That's what the USDA told people to do. And thank God we have finally learned that sometimes we can say we had it not only wrong, but we were so wrong, it's not even funny. Um, how much time have we talked and how much time do I have left? Uh, we're one minute before 1130. Okay, then I will tell you that the new way of farming is completely and utterly different. And I don't have time to tell you about it because I've used all my time telling you why the old way was wrong. The new way of farming is called no-till and it involves building organic matter, building organic matter and building organic matter through natural processes. And at the University of South Carolina, not Clemson, we have a professor named Buzz Clute, K-L-O-O-T. And if you will go to Buzz Clute, U-S-D-A, NRCS soil health series, you will learn about the miracle that is happening when you have farmers who are not so pig headed that they are willing to do things the new way. And one of the most ex exciting examples is right outside of Columbia, South Carolina. And that is Mr. Bunkies of Mr. Bunkies Tavern's son, Jason, Bun Jason um, and I can't remember Mr. Bucky's so last name right now, um, in Eastover, South Carolina. He is a leading example, and he almost never fertilizes, and he almost never has to add water to his fields. So there you go. Um, Buzz, B-U-Z Clute, he's originally from South Africa. He's at the Arnold School of Public Health, which shows you how important changing the face of farming is to the future of the human race and to the future of our climate. Excellent. Um, will you quickly say Buzz the, the Buzz Clute series again, real quick? Buzz Clute Soil Health Series, and I think you would put NRCS, but if you just, you y'all are good, y'all y'all can look things up. B U Z Clute K L O O T at the Arnold School of Public Health and the NRCS um, Natural Resources Conservation Soil whatever it is. Um, I never can remember what it stands for. Um, soil Health Series. He's got little two and three minute videos with farmers all over the country. It is a revolution and it includes carbon storage, which if you haven't been paying attention is going to be key to solving climate change and perhaps leaving a world that our grandchildren can live in. Excellent, well, I got a few questions for you. Uh, first question is who designs your flower hats? Um, one time 
I'd had kind of a long day and there was a guest on the show. Some people had come and I was making my hat. And as I said, I'd had kind of a long day and they said, you make your own hats. And I said, well, who the blank do you think? Heck, they, do you think makes them? I think I said H-E-L-L. -L. And um, they said the art department. And I said, we have five volunteers producing, helping us produce this show every day. That's why you need to send money to the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. Um, we don't even have enough money for a full staff to have a show. So I get, I wake up at two in the morning the night before, or I used to when um, we had shows that were live. And I would say, what in the name of God am I going to put in my head this morning? And um, so I make my own hats. And there was a new highway patrolman in South Carolina and he asked the older patrolman, he said, there's this woman I see climbing out of the railroad cut and ditches all the time. Do you know what's going on? And he said, I think she's looking for hat stuff. I would just leave her alone if I were you. Excellent. And uh, this is a comment, I believe. The attraction between molecules is known as the van der Waals force. I don't know. That's beyond me. You'll have to yeah, look it up and find out yourself. Can anything be done if you have nematodes? Um, there are good nematodes and there are bad nematodes. Um, there, there are few nematicides, not many. If you have nematodes in your garden, um, if, and that's probably what they have, that you need to practice rotation because certain crops like okra are the worst for nematodes. And so if you plant okra in this spot next year, you've got to plant okra in another spot the next year. You can also plant a whole area with turnips and collards and kale. And if you turn those under, if you till, which I don't recommend doing anymore, but if you do till them, there are properties in those brassicas, which is what we call the mustard family, that will kill nematodes. Uh, and the last thing is just a, uh, a comment here about how growing tomatoes and what you said earlier. To Amanda's point, each year I use Mater Maker compost and Black Cow compost to prepare the soil before planting tomatoes. They go crazy. And do not over compost. Um, if, you are, if you are using a raised bed, you should not use more than um, to every four or five bags of potting soil, one bag of compost. Too much compost means that your soil will be waterlogged and, you, and, um, and the, the, the air and water movement will not work. So um, please do not overdo the compost. Um, be judicious in using compost, please. Also, um, when it's over 95 degrees at night, tomatoes will not pollinate. Um, it's like when they told people if you wanted to get pregnant, you had to get boxer shorts, shorts for your, um, you had to get, you know, instead of, you know, tidy whities um, because of heat and sperm. And the same thing happens with tomatoes, um, with the pollen. And so it would, if it's hot in the summer, um, some cherry tomatoes will usually work, but um, other tomatoes simply will not pollinate. It's not anything you're doing wrong. Excellent information. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks a lot. It was nice to be with y'all. Don't forget about the ETV endowment. I'm tired. We need we um, we need professionals. We're glad for volunteers, but it'd be nice to have some professionals too. Bye bye. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate you joining us. As we close down, see your app for Monday, April fifth. Um, some announcements here. So your next four speakers. Oh, and I just realized actually one of these is on Wednesday. Mary, you might have to cover that Wednesday one. Um, at least that's what my calendar says. Um, when no, it, April it, 7th. It's, all, it's been canceled all Mondays. Okay, got you. So is Michael O'Toole on April 12th or is it still Gavin and JT? Uh, Gavin and JT. Okay. So uh, up next, sorry guys for that little uh, back and forth there. Uh, I just go off what I have in my writing here. So Monday, April 12th, Gavin and JT are going to be with us. Uh, that's next Monday, a year with COVID. They're, these guys do a podcast with ETV. Uh, two weeks from today, uh, I really hope we have a huge crowd because this is uh, quite a, an honor to get this speaker. Uh, and we'll be talking about something that every one of us should put in play with uh, Rotary is we'll have Joe Beveridge from Russell Hampton with us on April 19th 
to talk about why you use a rotary license vendor for rotary stuff. I think the moral of the message will be is if you're if you're doing something service related with rotary, wear it. Uh, and we'll end the month with Walter Hughes talking about water missions. Uh, also, another announcement about the virtual district conference that comes up less than one month now from today. Uh, it's actually one month from, well, it was one month from yesterday. It is May 4th. That is a Tuesday, 6.15 to 8.15 on Zoom. Information will be coming out, but we want you to be there. Uh, we've got some great speakers lined up, and I'm pleased to, uh, I think I gave a little teaser a couple weeks ago, but I can actually tell you who the keynote speaker is now. Uh, and if you're a football fan and you're a fan of Family of Rotary, which is the theme of the conference, is Family of Rotary, we will be joined by the Coastal Carolina head football coach, Jamie Chadwell, who had a remarkable season this year, undefeated in the regular season. Uh, his coaching style is all about family, which is why he will be our speaker on that district conference on May 4th, 6.15 to 8.15. Lots of awards. We got some special guests from Rotary International will be with us that night. So you definitely do not want to miss May 4th, and may the 4th be with you. I'll conclude with the Rotary four-way test, and we'll be on to a gorgeous Monday and a gorgeous rest of the week. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill or better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Have a wonderful Monday, guys. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next Monday for Gavin and JT on CRAP. Take care, guys. Have a great one. Bye-bye.